all the people that have been on this podcast, no matter what they do, what walk of life, they all have a lot of common traits. But one of the common traits is compassion and love and abundantly giving. And I and you know, we completely believe in helping and abundantly giving. And you've done all these amazing things that everyone out there has that chance to. Was there a point in your life where someone mentored or impacted you? Or was it something that you never had but wanted to give to the community? Um, it's just uh, all my coaches. Every coach I had since I was a kid. Uh, uh, the crazy thing, Chris Morris, uh, he was my park ball coach when I was a kid. And still, I talk to him every week almost. And um, just all the different coaches I had like through park ball. Uh, coach uh, Chief Dorsey was a police officer I had. Uh, all of us were police officers, uh, kids. Uh, I talked to week and um, high school coaches and wrestling from football, all those things. I feel like each one of those coaches I've had throughout my life has impacted me in a way. It's just like you wouldn't have had, had without playing sports. And uh, they were great father figures for me and growing up and just pretty much how to talk to become a young man and just continue to grow. Um, it's just I don't know how to explain it. Just I just want to be able to give back some of the lessons they taught me to give back to the younger generation, especially kids in high school from where I'm from, just to let them know, like, you can make it too if you put your mind to it. Like, no one can tell you what you can't do. Check it out. Hey guys, what's going on? This is David Chenier on another edition of New York Weekly's number one podcast for 2020. And today we have one of the biggest and brightest, the Iron Man, as I like to call him, for the NFL, which by the way is probably very impossible. Dalvin Thomason from the Minnesota Vikings defensive tackle. What a great guy. Welcome to the show, my friend. I appreciate you for having me. I appreciate you coming on, man. You know, what makes you so unique, and we talked about this before the, the, this, 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 this interview, was how much love that you're giving back to the community, how much love you're giving back to different things, how much love that you're doing everything that you're going from. But tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into football and how you found the love for football. Um, I found the love for football simply because uh, I, I would say I was three years old. Uh, I watched my older brother and my older cousin playing football, and I used to beg my mom to let me play all the time. And in Georgia, you could play at three years old, but I was bigger than every other three-year-old, so I wanted to play and wanted to be like my big brother. But um, they started a new league the following year when I turned four, and they let me play. So ever since then, I've put my feet on the – ever since I put my cleats on, I've never took them off and just – Kept running with it. You know, what's amazing is, and I love that, you know, you grew, you grew up and you started playing football and you were a bigger kid, which is kind of an amazing thing, right? Now they always wanted you to play. Did you always play defense or what did you start off with? Uh, I started off on both. I, I always played both. Uh, I pretty much played almost every position except for quarterback. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we want to hit those guys. We don't necessarily want to want, want to be those guys. So I, I love that, you know. <laughs> when you were sitting there, you chose – a great community like Alabama, right? Great school. Some of the amazing things that you guys have done. You know, how did you, what attracted you to Alabama and how did that make you grow as a human being and a player complete? Mm -hmm. um, I was attracted to Bama because I remember the first time I visited down there, um, my mom was always big on academics. You're an athlete, you're a student before you're an athlete. And I'm, in my household, you had to have good grades that you couldn't go on the football field. So when I went to Alabama the first time, Coach Saban actually set me up to go to the business school before I even went inside the football facility. And um, that was a big impact on me. It, sh it showed me how much he actually cares about the players off the field and the, the things he wants you to accomplish later on in life after football because more to life than just football. So that was a big impact on me. And then uh, – that's when I went to Alabama, the Alabama LSU game. When actually Alabama lost by three points, that's the atmosphere at that game was it was crazy, and I was like, I had to, yeah, I got to play for this. It's it, it's amazing, you know. I love that you that you said that about Coach Saban and how he wants to educate the players and become players and become better, and that business is so important, right? And business is a key part, like you said. I mean, the average player hopefully plays for as long as they can, but what happens afterwards? And I love that you've instilled that in you. And I love that your mother instilled that more. So I should have sat next to you and looked off of your paper because I wasn't that good in school. 
Well, that would have been great. What did you study? What did you study in the university? Like, what made you really interested in business? I always love business. I love numbers and things like that. But I, I actually have two degrees. My first one was in finance, and the second one was financial planner. It's just sitting oh, in those man. business classes. I was super excited about it. So I used to go to class super excited every day. You know what's amazing about that is a lot of people who know of all my shows, I'm an ex-Deloitte managing partner. I was one of the youngest managing partners in the world, right? And finance yeah. has always been the most beautiful thing because numbers don't lie. Like numbers tell the yeah. truth, right? They tell the stats. It's universal. It's beautiful. And you've done something amazing. You have two degrees. Man, I didn't even get one. But how hard was it for you to do two degrees while being an all-star athlete and still trying to you know, maintain your life? Uh, it was tough. Uh, you know, when you get there, time management is probably the biggest part. But uh, in Alabama, they do a great job is you know, knowing that you have classes in the morning, in the afternoon, you have football. And then after football, you go straight to study hall. They get all your homework and quizzes and stuff like that. And uh, just perfect test and everything because they have all the setup when you have a test on this day and the, you need to study for this this day and everything just so you could be up to par with everything. Make sure you get in the classroom as well as no football. So, yeah. Our management part was better. you know th th that's amazing because you balance it both and you and you made it work you know when you were trying to do all that and putting it all together the finances all the business and all the models that were there was there anything that stood out to you that you felt you could do after football that was just going to be super amazing and impactful um there was a lot of stuff just because uh i know i remember taking estate planning and all this stuff and just come out of the room and just the finance side of and um, just investment banking it was one that really caught my eye because I I could see myself being an investment banker after football. And um, just uh, just pretty much anything that has to do with numbers and funds, I'm I, I can do after football. So I was super excited about that. That, that. that that that's amazing. I definitely need you to help me plan my estate, and we could definitely work together on the finance side. But I love that you're so acute and aware of the necessities of finance and numbers, man. I mean, it's it's definitely not an easy thing. But you understand, you understand bottom line, you understand top dollar, and that's what's going to make it so impactful going from there. When you were sitting in, in Alabama and you're sitting there and you're playing in some of the biggest games in the world, man, and all these people are screaming and they're screaming <laughs> for you because you're just killing out there. Which game was your favorite in Alabama? What really stood out for you? Oof, that's, that's a tough one. Um, which one was the favorite? I love going to Death Valley and LSU uh, every two years. That was – this, that game was amazing. It's, uh, I don't know, it's an atmosphere against the LSU, uh, SEC opponent, especially of that caliber. It's, that was a big one. And I can't say any of the national championship games. But <laughs> um, when we were in Arizona, we played Clemson. That was that was a that was a shootout. <laughs> it just kept going back and forth. You know, going to take it at the end. So, yeah, that was, that was probably some of the best games I played in there. Man, you've made it, brother. I mean – at 27, bro, two degrees, playing in an NFL. We'll talk to the, about the gaming component in a second, man. But you have made it, dude. Kudos to you. We got we to gotta get you on a book, man, and talk about this amazing journey that you set up because it's so unique and different and so humbling as well, man. I love it. You know, here you are at Alabama and you're killing and playing these big games, like you said, LSU and Clemson. At what point were you like, man, I really have a chance to make the league? Was it like some sort of moment you're like, dude, this is it. I'm going to make it. Any point of that in your life at, when you're playing? Um, I, You know, as a, a athlete, especially a collegiate athlete, you you won't always want to make a NFL player. Um, I would have to – halfway through my senior year, I was just like, this is very possible I could play in the NFL. And I just, you know – I've been preparing the whole time I was in Alabama, but just at that point, I was just like, this is a, I possibly accomplished my dream and it's closer than I ever thought it would be. So it's like, I have to just continue to grind and do everything I did to get to this point and it'll pay off and it got what it did. So <laughs> I don't know, like I was excited when I actually got drafted. I, I started crying because I wasn't expecting it. So I was expecting it, but it was just like a dream come true. So yeah, that, I'm sure some videos of me crying somewhere. <laughs> man you know that, that I, I love that because that's so much humility and that's really appreciation of what you've done and what you have you're so well-rounded man and, and I think you know there's so many moments in our lives where there's like these pivotal moments that you remember that are just so amazing and I think that one would be the one that I wish I could have always done in my life I always tell my fiance I'm like man I wish I could have been pro I could have gotten pro 
but you have done such an amazing thing and inspired that. And I think that's, that's really, really great. So here you are, you know, at draft night, right? And I mean, you got a pretty darn high pick. I mean, you're, you're talking about second round. I mean, this is, that's an unbelievable thing. How did that make you feel? I uh, feel great. Um, the crazy thing is I remember uh, just at the, the little draft party my, at my family's place and all my family was there. I was like, I hope I don't go anywhere with high taxes. You know, just to find it and suck it. And I was like, I don't want to pay super high taxes because you already get taxed enough. And then, um, I remember when I hung up the phone, I was like, we're going to New York. <laughs> and um, my brother made a joke that's like, yeah, you're going to be paying a lot of taxes up there. And it was just so funny. Like, uh, yeah, just the finance side of me kicked in. I was just like, that's, that's so crazy because I said I didn't go where it was high taxes, but I was super blessed at the time. Uh, love the organization, love the people I met up there. And uh, it was just the, the process of just going through the drink. A blessing. It, it's amazing. That's where the estate planning comes in, man, because the taxes part. I, I see you, man. That's that big smile right there, dude. That, that is where, where, where it gets super amazing because people don't realize that you can almost deduct a lot of things, right? And then you could do it the right way. And still, if you want to, you know, in your case and probably many, many people's cases, but, you know, you can take the money, you can donate, you can help people. And you've mm -hmm. done a lot of that, right? Tell me a little about some of the foundations you're working on because you're giving back a lot to the community. You're helping kids try to get to college. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, a few of the community uh, organizations I work with is uh, K Club. It's pretty much an organization that help uh, K Club families uh, go through the grieving process of losing a loved one at a young age or just pretty much any age. Uh, K -Club, um, uh so many i can't think of all of them that good grief is also another one it was pretty much almost the same thing this even process and motivate kids and shout letting them know that other people that went through the same thing they've been through and then the american cancer society is a big one i helped with the american diabetes association and um it's just all these different organizations have hit home for me just throughout my life in different areas and um just to be able to give back and just even let people know you have somebody in your who's been through the same thing and still ended up successful. And um, you can't just give up because your loved one, you may have lost somebody, you might be going through a rough patch. Uh, you can just give up. Other Your loved ones wouldn't want you to give up. So uh, I try to give back as much as I can because you never know. Uh, so one small conversation may have the biggest impact on a, a, maybe like a child's and you'll never know who you, who you can affect. So just always try to give back and be a blessing to others while you can be. Wow, man, that is that is so refreshing and so amazing to hear. And I, and I and I you know what's really interesting about this podcast, my man, is all the people that have been on this podcast, no matter what they do, what walk of life, they all have a lot of common traits. But one of the common traits is compassion and love and abundantly giving. And I and you know we completely believe in helping and abundantly giving. And you've done all these amazing things that everyone out there has that chance to, was there a point in your life where someone mentored or impacted you or was it something that you never had, but wanted to give to the community? Um, it's just, uh, all my coaches and coach I had since I was a kid, uh, uh the crazy thing, Chris Morris, uh, he was my park ball coach when I was a kid and still I talked to him every week almost. And, um, just all the different coaches I had like through park ball, uh, Coach uh, Chief Dorsey was a police officer. I had uh, all of them police officers as uh, kids. Uh, I talked we in um, high school coaches and wrestling from football, all those things. Uh, I feel like each one of those coaches I've had throughout my life has impacted me in a way. It's just like you wouldn't have had, had without playing sports. And uh, they were great father figures for me and growing up and just pretty much how to talk to become a young man and just continue to grow. Uh, it's just I don't know how to explain it. Just, I just want to be able to give back some of the lessons they taught me to give back to the younger generation, especially kids in high school from where I'm from, just to let them know, like, you can make it too if you put your mind to it. Like, no one can tell you what you can't do. You know what I love about what you just said is you don't know what impact we can make on people, people make on us. And like you said, that one conversation, that one second can almost change your entire life. But when you come from an area where everyone knows you and knows that you came from an area like, like I came to this country homeless, right? People know that and I ate bugs. Like that was the only way I was going to make it. But when you tell these stories to people and you actually make it, it gives them hope, man. But you, my friend, 
not only are you giving them hope, you're giving them hope, not just an education. You're not showing hope that you make an NFL. You're not showing hope that you can do it mentally, but that balance that you've put together has been so impressive off and on the NFL. What made you realize that the need to balance all that out? Because some of us, especially at a young age, man, you're 27, right? I'm 41. So like 27, I was nowhere near your maturity level of understanding the need of having this balance in the center piece. And I know you could, I know you have it because I could just see it by talking to you. How did you find that balance in your piece, man? I mean, it's such an amazing thing at such a young age. Uh, just do I, uh, I would have to say uh, my mom, she was my biggest inspiration. Just learning from her. She's like my best for everything. Just knowing like pretty much the way I am today is exactly how she had. And I try to mimic her uh, throughout my life because she was a great woman and um, just she put others first. And um, she just pretty much taught me that life is always bigger than you. You're not the always have to be the center of attention because there's other people who may need to be the center piece of their attention at that given moment. And um, you have to always give back and focus on others as much as yourself, too, because it's also important that you focus on yourself. If you're in a position where you can help others, help them, because you never know who needs help or who just needs a smile that day and things like that. So I always try to, you know, balance myself around that. And, um, yeah, this pretty much just mimicking her through the whole, is, uh, I guess, how I have peace. <laughs> That, 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 that's amazing, man. I, we got to get your mom on this show, man, because you raised, you're right, and she could definitely inspire a lot of people by doing it the right way that you're messaging that. You played a ton of straight games. I mean, no, I mean, like literally, I'm sure you've been injured and hurt, but you played and you've broken through. You're a big component of physical and mental health. How has that helped you and what resumes do you do to be so consistent? Now, don't tell me everything because we can't let the offense go. Yeah. <laughs> but tell me enough so that our general people can learn from someone as amazing as you. Um, I would have to, you, know, you have to take body. Um, pretty much what you, what you put in and give to your, like, you know, the health you give your body, it'll give back to you. And um, it's an everyday thing. It's not just I'm going to do one thing today to carry my body and, uh, I would guess the biggest mental part to, to keep me mis- mentally there and available all the time is video. <laughs> I'm a, I play video because I was a kid. And, uh, that's like my getaway. Um, I'm like in a whole different world when I'm video game. So I just <laughs> get away. I a video game almost every day. Man, every day. <laughs> now, now we got to play because I love hearing that, man. How did you get into gaming, man? Tell me how, how, like, how did you get into it? Let me talk about that first. Um, I got into gaming. I couldn't even remember the first game I picked up, but I, I used to always like we used to have video games at the house. It was like I found my uncle's. We had an old Atari or Super Nintendo, a Nintendo sixty four. I had at the home, at house at home, and uh, the PlayStation box. Pretty much every game and console we played, and um, uh, it's just been a passion of mine. Any video game, no matter what kind of genre it is, I love it. <laughs> and um, yeah, I just. Every my family is like a big game, I would say. Everybody gamed at one point in their life. And I used to have all my cousins and my brother and everybody else used to come to the house. And it would be like, like probably like 12 kids. And we all just in there playing video games all day. And then, of course, we used to get kicked out the house to go outside. But other than that, you know, we all used to video game. And it's just been a passion of mine ever since because it's video game. It can do so much to bring people together. Even though you're not neighbors in the same room across the world, they will be brought together with friends you probably haven't seen since college or high school, and y'all can just catch up and play a game together. And it's like been hanging out just like this. So, yeah, I've been loving video games ever since I picked up my first controller. Now, you guys probably had tournaments and set it up. What games were you guys playing, and how good were you compared to everyone else? I, I always felt like I was above average. <laughs> Now your cousins are listening, so if you were smoking them, you got to tell them that so that they can hear. Oh, yeah, most definitely. I was, yeah, I was destroying pretty much everybody. And um, yeah, you know, as we got older, the like high school, mine were for like, my favorite of all time, probably my favorite video game. But uh, we used to play a lot of two K, uh, NBA Live back in the day. Madden. Uh, I used to lose in Madden a lot, which is crazy, but Madden isn't my game. But not any shooter game, I won hands down. <laughs> What 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 what's your favorite FPS? Favorite of all time has to be Modern Warfare Two. 
Because I love just, Modern Warfare too, man. That was different, like, man. That was different. Like, between the kills, the guns, it was just like it was perfect. Like I, I don't know. It was everything was great on that game, and um, it's probably uh some of the battlefields I love from Battlefield because it's so realistic compared to Modern Warfare. Like yeah, the bullet drop off and everything. I love I love Battlefield game. Like Battlefield Four is one of my all time favorite Battlefield. I love it, man. We got to get on the 2K thing, too. We got a couple of pro players, part of the NACL. We got our pro Madden players. We've been playing 2K for 30-some-odd years, 40 years, like you said, in NBA Live yeah. when it first started. <laughs> and it's such a great game, man, and, 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 it, and it's really gotten better. It's become part of the lifestyle, the current career mode. Mm-hmm. You can go play with Drake. I mean, that's some dope stuff. And so got to go hustle <laughs> at the park and get that 99, man, you know what I'm saying? But I love that you do all this stuff and going from there. When you game, this is one thing I believe in. I tell this to a lot of parents. I said – you know, when I grew up, from 9 to 3 p.m. was the time that you would get in trouble. You go on the streets, you do something not good, you hang out with your friends, you go past 12, nothing good happens. But in the gaming community, 9 to 3 is prime time. 9, <laughs> 9 to 3 is when Twitch is happening. So I tell people this. I'm like, look, do you want your kid to talk to their friends online about gaming and things that matter? We don't go running the streets from 9 to 3, right? And they're always like, well, that makes sense. You're a gaming component. And you said something that was so pivotal. You get to talk to people and networking going from them, right? Maybe help with their mm-hmm. financial planning as well, because my man knows all this stuff, right? So you're <laughs> really breaking it down for them, and you're in another zone. Tell me that zone that you're in, because a lot of people don't understand that zone, what it does to you mentally, and how it helps you prepare for the next day. Can you explain that a little bit to our audience? Yeah, that zone for me, it's like, um, how can I explain it? Uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie Soul. Like they did a great job explaining. Like you, when you're in the zone, you go to a whole different place. And um, this like it's the same for a ball field in a game. And the game on is on the line. Like I'm there. I'm nowhere else. My mind can't focus. I can't even think about anything else because I'm I'm here. And um, it's just like it's so relaxed that it's like you get an adrenaline rush from it at the same time because you're so excited, but yet you're so focused. And um, all. Just the, the zone I go in is just it's so relaxing. So when I get off the game, it's just like, okay, I'm back in the real world, but yet I'm reset. Like everything mental is reset. My shoulder or something was hurting. I don't feel it anymore. <laughs> like mentally, I'm just like, it's just like you just got out of a massage or something. You're just so relaxed, or you just got out the shower or something like that. That's the kind of zone I get in when I play the game. Wow, man. That is a zone that people understand. You almost break away. You don't have to think about things. You get to be you, mm-hmm. have a good time, you know, not worry about anything else and then get back to it. But it's a mental break. It's a, it's almost like a meditation for gamers and esports guys. Mm-hmm. You go get that, which makes me super excited because you're doing something pretty big, man. This is Alabama versus Auburn, tradition, Iron Bowl. And you're playing against a guy that you play with, you know, in New York, probably wouldn't have. Played yeah. with them when we were back in the day, but you guys became friends. Big Darius Slayton. And you guys are doing this big iron ball thing with us at NACL. And we're helping the kids, we're trying to help the community make it big and growing from there. What is your prediction that you're going to do in Fortnite? How many kills are you going to get against Darius? And how much better do you think your team is going to be over his? I'm, I'm saying um, it now. I'm saying it now. Uh, prediction wise, I'm definitely going to do a lot of this in Darius. I know that for sure. And uh, I haven't played Fortnite, but I'm, I'm getting my skills back right now. I haven't played in a while, but uh, I'm going to do better than Darius. I say I'll get 10 more kills than Darius. Ooh, <laughs> 10 more kills than Darius. You guys heard that first. I'm going to tell Darius you said 10 more kills. Now, you got a partner. Do you want to tell us who your partner is, or are we waiting for game day when this happens? I'll probably get it for game day this is Ooh, I like this. You know, we don't know who Darius is bringing on, but we definitely know that you're probably going to bring on someone that could really, really play. Uh, that's going to be super, super amazing as well, you know, and going from there. The traditions of the Iron Bowl, right? Tell me how big this was for people that don't understand how big this is for the Roll Tide and against Auburn. Uh, it's huge. Uh, pretty much any Alabama fan you talk to, you're going to have – type of iron bowl conversation about it um it's just like because you know alabama really doesn't have any professional nfl teams or anything so the iron bowl is like pretty much if you win that you win the whole state <laughs> and the 
Auburn Alabama fans, uh, like they're so diehard fans. It's like the eye is almost everything. And uh, around, you're gonna have professors talk to the and like you, it's a, it's a, it's week two, and we're talking about the Iron Bowls is all the last game of the season. And it's, it's so crazy. Uh, the atmosphere changes during Auburn week <laughs> around the whole campus. Everybody's so focused. And like you might even, uh, the professor might cancel a quiz or something just so you can focus on uh, the Iron Bowl week and get more st- uh, reps and uh, mental reps at pra- about football practice and meetings and all that stuff. Or they might cancel a class to the facility and get it. <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's super serious down there. The, the Iron Bowl is, 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 is super huge. Because if the Iron Bowl, you probably had a bad season. <laughs> yeah. You know what I like about this is the professors might cancel class. So when we're doing this Iron Bowl and we're doing the same thing for esports and this game thing, I want to get the Alabama guys and the Auburn guys, not just you guys, to go against each other. And the way I'm proposing it is is top, is combined kill points. So the Alabama is all right. So we got to get more Alabama guys where they're playing currently in college, students that can play, Auburn guys that there because – we got to show them that you're doing it big. You know, I'm, I'm a big Roll Tide fan, so that makes me super excited to see what you're <laughs> going to be doing and going from there, man. You know, as we're wrapping up this show, I always say this. What is one piece of advice that you can give anybody that has helped you along your journey? Um, piece of advice would have to be um, a tough one just to pick one. <laughs> um, I would have to say just – no matter what life throws at you, um, never forget why. Never forget why you started the journey you in in the first place. And if you always remember your why, like nothing, nothing can stop you from what you want to accomplish. That's amazing, man. What a great story. You know, for David Chen and Dalvin Thomason from the Minnesota Vikings, we want to catch you guys November 11th on our Twitch channels, on his Twitch channel, battling it out. For the first annual NACL Iron Bowl champion, we think the big man here is going to do it. He's got 10 more kills and go over Darius. I won't be <laughs> counting and watching it. I won't be casting that one. So I'm going to hear me. I'm going to be here. I'm like, Dalvin, you got one more kill. You got two more kills. I'm going to cast that one. And it'll be fire, man. <laughs> Give us your social media handle so everyone can follow you and your amazing journey that you for the rest of your life. Yeah, uh, Instagram. Uh, Dalvin, Tomlinson, Dalvin underscore Tomlinson. Uh, Twitter is Dalvin Tomlinson. And uh, yeah, my Twitter is uh, what the heck 28 But soon it's going to be t- Dalvin Tomlinson. I'm going to switch over. That's my old school uh, gamer tag from like middle school. So I'm going to switch it over. <laughs> hey, I like that, man. I'm going to add you on that. I might have to change the name to Killer Tomlinson or <laughs> Profit if you beat him by 10. So that's what I'm going to tell you that right oh, now. If man. you get that 10, I'm going to change it to Profit or something like that, man. Amazing. Profit. That's a good one. No profit, man. <laughs> You know, what a great time, Dalvin. Thank you for inspiring and motivating and just being an awesome human being. This is what the world needs. For David Chen, New York Weekly's number one podcast for 2020 Panonomics, and Dalvin Thomason, we'll see you guys soon. Have a good night. Peace.